You're watching YBL TV. This is Erica Blackwell with YBL TV. Please welcome Richie Huffman, Senior Director of Technology and Analytics at Equifax. Richie is an expert in identification, verification, and authentication technologies. Glad to have you on our show, Richie. Well, thank you, Erica. Thanks for uh, having me. Wireless has certainly become the new battleground in the fight to mitigate fraud risk. Subscriber fraud tops billions of dollars, representing a huge challenge for telecom service providers to properly verify the ID of consumers applying for service. Sure, every cell phone has an ESN number, a SIM card, browsers can be secured, but consumers can still have their wallet lost or stolen, their identity taken over, and before they know it, a much higher cell phone bill and lost time repairing their credit. Let's talk mobile biometrics, Richie. Fingerprinting, face recognition, retina, iris scans. I'm all for physiological ID verification, perhaps over behavioral token and knowledge-based ID systems. I don't like typing very much, and perhaps like a lot of other people, I can't remember all my passwords either. And we've hopefully all got a computer webcam, a smartphone with a camera. India, I understand, has got the largest biometrics database in the world, Aadhaar, with over 500 million residents enrolled. What are the challenges to market for mobile biometrics? And what role, if any, is Equifax taking in this market? Well, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting problem that we have. And one of the things that I uh, have been keeping my eyes on, my, my uh, pulse meter on, is how quickly we're going to see the adoption in the U.S. of biometrics for authentication. Because it is the holy grail of authentication, uh, bar none. It works, and it works uh, almost every time when you when apply. The, the biggest obstacle is that Biometrics, while well, they may be collected in certain situations for authentication, I'll give you an example, a university uh, access card or an employment access card. Uh, government uses it a lot uh, for certain access to facilities. But it's, it's their biometric. It's in their database. It's not shared for others to use. So right now we have these little, I call them chimney stacks of, of biometrics collected for certain use cases that are not then leverageable across mass market. Um, so that, that piece of it is the obstacle. I think with technology today, part, part, of, part of the reason why it was that way is because there was a very difficult time collecting the biometric. Um, technologies were not, uh, did not come along. They had to be in a, in a pristine environment to collect the biometric. But today, we see technologies that have surpassed anything we could have ever dreamed in terms of capture, uh, high quality capture of a biometric, uh, such as a facial uh, imprint, a three-dimensional facial imprint with a camera on a smartphone. Um, similarly, you could do fingerprints through something like a, a smartphone or even a, a laptop uh, mm -hmm. fingerprint device. Mm -hmm. So we have those technologies and voice has come a long, long way uh, in, in doing voice uh, recognition is different than voice authentication. You don't have to have the dialect in, in, in you know, all in the uh, technology. All you have to have is the mathematical equation of the voice intonation. Even when they're sick, it's the same. Mm -hmm. So that technology has now uh, reached a, a point where it's about to leapfrog into acceptable biometric. Retina scan, a little hard. Um, that's going to be a little more challenging. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's got to be too precise in a lot of places to get that accurate, but it, it, maybe one day it'll, it'll be there. So those are the challenges. Um, in, in what we're seeing, we see biometrics uh, being applied today on the facial side and on the print side with smartphones, but the, um, but the master database is not there. For us, you know, the, the database in the cloud, if you will, is not there to hit and use across everybody's uh, uh, business. Biometrics is closer than you think for authentication, and so I'm going to demonstrate in our session uh, live working, real use case, real working functionality of, of biometrics in action. It's not an exchange yet. Uh, we haven't evolved to the point where we have a central database of exchange biometrics, but it is using facial recognition, making sure it belongs to a, a real identity and that that real identity is alive and, and, and interacting with the, the business person with that ID in hand. It is exciting because it means we've now taken one big step 
towards that ultimate goal of having a biometric authentication method. What are some of the innovations you're seeing in fraud data exchanges? In fraud data exchanges, they've always been around, so that's not new to us. We, we are seeing data exchanges that have kind of built up around through traditional identity. Somebody does application fraud, they get reported into a database as, being, as having committed application fraud. So that's old school. Uh, we are seeing the building of device uh, identities into a reputational database where people report back, I had a device do business with me that turned out to be fraud, and they report that fraud type into that into that reputational exchange. Still, it's great for the to know it on the device, but it doesn't tie the device back to the identity. Mm-hmm. What we're doing is we're linking now identity and device uh, insights together. So if, it's, if there's fraud going on on one side or the other, we can see it before it hits. The other thing that you're seeing is the two of them together give you less false positives. They give you more accuracy. Very important because some of the problems that we have with tools today is that their high false positive rates make them too cost ineffective to actually use in a mass way. And so that's, a, that's a, got to be solved for these things to work. When I see biometrics come into play, um, that takes the false positive rate down to, you know, very small numbers, if in any, whenever they really can identify you. So that's that's really where we are. Um, we haven't got the exchanges or the reporting on the biometric piece yet. I don't think it'll be here for a few years because we've mm-hmm. got to get the exchange up for biometric. But that's, that's kind of where we are today. We have silos that now are starting to get linked together and corroborated. Where do you see some of the challenges that the cell phone manufacturers are facing here today? Well, in... The, the cell phone business is, is ripe for, uh, I, I would say, exploitation, uh, both, both as, a, uh, as a mechanism to commit fraud, more so than committing fraud on cell phone providers themselves. Um, it's also a perfect platform to become the, the, uh, the shield on fraud. And so, for example, you can create uh, on these applications that run right on the phone, you can create very tight security around the applications themselves. The applications can do things such as facial recognition and comparing that to a, a document that is uh, issued by some authority and see if the facial piece matches to the document. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we have an opportunity with the cellular phone uh, carriers to become part of the solution and to monetize that solution. Um, but the, the The problems they're facing on the cellular side directly from fraud is that people are finding the phones to be lucrative on the black market. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're finding the the services, the channel to be lucrative to uh, tunnel into and get access to people's private information, which then gets them to other things that are of value. So cell phones have the challenge of making sure that the person who's interacting on that phone and on that device, who's asking for service, from the cell phone company, um, that they are who they say they are. And knowledge-based authentication, while it works, uh, you know, is what we had in the past, it is very cumbersome, and it has mm-hmm. a fairly high false positive rate. Mm-hmm. So that in and of itself makes it less useful in the mass populations versus something like a passive check behind the scenes where we do data analytics, both by uh, behavioral and regression analytics with connected inner, inner sources, then you can start to, to whittle away the population that's really risky from the good, you know, basically good population, and then you can do some of these more what I call friction activities. Even biometric is a friction, right? You got to do something. The user has to do something. Um, but you can do that on five, eight, twelve percent of the population versus thirty, forty, fifty percent of the population big improvement in operational efficiency, customer experience, and fraud capture because you're isolating to the right population to, to, to check harder on. With big data comes big responsibility, Rich. As you may know, there have been some internal security breaches within the data broker industry. How does Equifax protect its clients' data? Obviously, we've been doing it for 120-plus years uh, as a company, um, not without some challenges on occasion, but the encryption devices that, that, and the encryption methods we use 
on one way. The other way is uh, we, we actually apply some of these techniques that I'm explaining to you to keep people from getting to data that they don't that they don't have the right to get to. Mm-hmm. So we, we are employing a lot of the same concepts and tools that we have here, layered authentication, layered insights, and uh, in protecting the franchise that way. But more explicitly, it's um, it's more about our IT uh, infrastructure. We obviously we do the firewalls and everything, but we separate uh, access controls. We keep things uh, completely independent so that one person can't get to the keys of the kingdom all alone. And we uh, we have a lot of uh, anomaly detection and things like that on monitors on our systems to make sure that any elevated activity, any suspicious activity is trapped and uh, and quarantined in a a very expeditious manner. One of the things that uh, every time we see these breaches, I think it was the Target breach and then we saw the the Home Depot breach uh, recently, when we see those here at Equifax, there is a uh, mass uh, recalibration check of everything we're doing to make sure that we don't have any of that kind of uh, potential sitting in our layered security. We keep everything encrypted as best we can. We can't encrypt everything at rest, but we can encrypt most things at rest. And so that's that's our strategy to keep the bad guys from getting the good data. Richie Huffman, Senior Director of Technology and Analytics at Equifax. Thanks so much for joining us here at YBL TV. Yes, thank you for having me.